next Saturday. Christmas comes early. Unbelievable. Welcome to this incredible scene. Bills. To the end zone. Chargers. It's a touchdown. An exclusive NFL game. That's fantastic. Live in primetime. Wow. Only on Peacock. With a Christmas gift to their fans. They're having some fun now. Bills versus Chargers. Next Saturday, 730 Eastern. Exclusively on Peacock. Introducing Royal Caribbean's newest ship, Icon of the Seas, the ultimate family vacation. The ultimate six slides, eight neighborhoods, zero compromise vacation. The ultimate never done that, can't wait to do it vacation. The ultimate chillin' by a different pool every day of the week vacation. This is the Icon of Vacations. Icon of the Seas, arriving in 2024. Book today. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry Bahamas. Apple Card is the credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back up front when you use it to buy a new iPhone 15, AirPods, or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.15% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Savings accounts by Goldman Sachs Bank USA. Member FDIC. Terms apply. Hello and welcome to The Paddock and the Pavilion with Stephen Wallace. In each show, Stephen will interview someone connected to the world of horse racing or cricket. Hello everyone. On today's podcast, I'm delighted to be joined by Lisa Kitely, a former Australian star batter who now coaches the England women's team. Welcome to The Paddock and the Pavilion, Lisa. Thank you for the invite and I'm um, more than happy to be here. Well, thank you very much. Welcome back to the UK. Um, after the ashes in the World Cup and all that travelling around, uh, did you get chance to have a a break in Australia? Yeah, I was pretty much on the road. I left England on the 24th of December um, and then obviously going all the way through to the World Cup final. And I think, gosh, I can't even remember when that finished now, but I had a great break. I went back to Perth for... Um, uh, just on six weeks and got back into the UK on the 20th um, of May. Well, I know Perth well, so it's a nice place to, to actually spend some time. Uh, on the podcast, we're going to talk about your illustrious career and how women's cricket has grown during that period. How did you first start playing bat and ball? Yeah, well, usually... Um, when I meet people and they ask me what I do and I say cricket and whatever, um, I usually just say I have three brothers and usually they don't ask me any more questions, but my three brothers hate cricket, never played cricket and um, have no interest in cricket. But I did have an auntie, um, sorry, a first cousin who was 10 years older than me and she played uh, for New South Wales in the under 21s and she used to um, drag me around to all these tournaments throughout New South Wales and I pretty much got into it when I was in high school. We had a, a girls' cricket team and we used to play cricket and softball and that's what we did through high school. And it all sort of led from there, really. That's normally normally brothers and, and, and in this case it wasn't them, was it? Yeah, no, it's hilarious. Um, it's quite funny. They never played a game in their life and absolutely rubbish at it. So it's quite funny that I have three brothers and none of them are interested or a dad who's ever played. And that's in Australia as well, of all places. Yeah. 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 So it was females who got me into cricket, which is probably back in those days against the norm. Well, you first played for New South Wales as a 21 year old in December, 1992. And within just over two years, you were playing for Australia, what did it mean to you to to play for your country? Uh, it's quite interesting. Um, I didn't really take cricket too serious, even when I was playing seniors. And then my first year in seniors, I got into the Australian squad. Um, and then the following year, I got selected at the championship. So um, I, I sort of just went along with it. And it was something that I was um, good at. And I kept doing because it's always nice to do something you're good at. Um, so probably when I first got in the Australian team, I took it a little bit more serious and trained and um, seriously and moved down to Sydney to um, 
play down there more regularly because in my GLs I only could play men's cricket. Um, so to play for Australia um, growing up, um, I didn't really think about it. I didn't see it on telly. I didn't know you could do it. Um, and then as I went through the pathway, I thought, oh, yeah, that, that would be nice to do, but didn't really um, know if I'd get there. And then once I got into the senior team, I sort of thought, right, I can give this a go and got in the Australian team. And, um, yeah, it was, um, yeah, great honour, something you look back on and fond memories of um, your debut. And you must have been doing a, an, a job as well at the same time as playing for Australia. Yeah. Um, so I went down to Sydney and I worked in a conference company um, and I used to work there from I think it was six to uh, six to three. Um, I did the early shift um, there because I could then go to training in the evening. Um, so I drive over. I worked at North Sydney, and then I'd drive over the bridge to um, Sydney Cricket Ground, and we'd train at the SCG, which was pretty nice. And then I did that for uh, probably three or four years, and then I got a job at Cricket New South Wales um, looking after their uh, high performance programs and community cricket uh, and then from then on all the way through my career um, I was working at Cricket New South Wales and, and playing for New South Wales in Australia which was really handy because um, obviously asking for leave and that for um, tours um, was a lot easier at Cricket New South Wales than um, some of the other girls experiences um, with their jobs or university. Yeah, I've spoken to other guests and the, the sort of challenges they had to take time off, unpaid leave and that sort of thing, just to play cricket for their country. So that must have made it made it a little bit easier for you. Uh, uh, it was definitely made it a lot easier working at Cricket New South Wales. They gave me all unpaid leave. Um, and at the end of the year, I felt really bad taking holidays because I'd been away so much. So I ended up having heaps of holidays um, in the bank because I was, I was too, I don't know, worried about using them when I'd been away for, you know, a month and a half here, two months there. I didn't feel like I could come back and say, I'm going, oh, if, if it's possible, can I have next month off? <laughs> so I ended up having a lot of leave in the bank as well. So, yeah, it was a brilliant place to work and I was really lucky. Well, looking at your cricket career, you did sort of have quite a lot of time off work because you had uh, three England tours um, and also played in three World Cups. And I wanted to talk to you about the, the three World Cups that you played in, in 1997, 2000 and 2005, two of which Australia won. And of course, well, and also in, 2000, in the World Cup 2000, where Australia lost in the final, you were the player of the series. Yeah, yeah. I can't talk about that. I don't like talking about it because I actually got a duck in the final and um, yeah, I wasn't going to was mention hitting, that. Yeah. <laughs> I was hitting them really well up until then. Um, so, yeah, I'm really disappointed um, to play so well and then um, to not get the job done in the final. So that was uh, a bit of my career that I try and block out um, quite quite often. Yeah, look, I actually wrote them down. I'm going to read them out now. But in the 2000 World Cup, your scores were 44, 56, 49, 74, 10, 51, 91 not out and um, we'll forget the last one um, <laughs> in the final against New Zealand but how difficult is it when you're doing well as a an individual and then the team must have been so disappointing to lose the final yeah it was it's, it was quite funny because when we were I, I'm going to speed a forward a little bit when we were at the World Cup in New Zealand that's just gone they were playing these highlights of of this 2000 World Cup um, and I was getting texts from the players, are you watching <laughs> this 2000 World Cup final? I said, no, I, I haven't watched it, but from this, from when we played it, I've never watched it and I don't um, want to start now when I know the result and I know how I played. But um, that, that's the brilliant thing about cricket, isn't it? You can um, play a team sport. Um, and there's so many things that can happen individually within your game. Um, but basically the reason why I love playing cricket is because it was a team sport. I played a lot of team sports as a kid. Um, and the brilliant thing about cricket, you can have success individually and lose. You can have a poor result individually and win. Um, and then within a game, so many individuals can do 
really well, but you can still lose. So um, I think that's the nature of the game and that's what uh, we all love um, and we want to do. And But it's, I've been in many teams and with the World Cup final, um, when I got a duck and the team lost, um, it doesn't get much lower than that <laughs> in team sports and especially if you've not done well yourself. But I can definitely um, not get runs in a, in a team and we've won many games and I've still had fantastic nights out after. So uh, I suppose that's the nature of the beast and that's why we love cricket. There's so many nuances within a game and in results and you can still do pretty poor or have a poor tour, but the team win. You can still have a really good time along the way. So, um, yeah, but that was a double whammy, a low score and and a loss in a World Cup final. It was pretty quiet dressing room, put it that way. Well, we'll move on to uh, successful tours of England, which you had. You came to England in 1998, 2001 and 2005. And, a special day was on the 21st of July, 1998, when you became the first uh, woman cricketer to score, to score an international century at Lords. That yeah, must have been a special day. You'd say that's good timing, wouldn't you? <laughs> I think I only got 400s and one of them was at Lords. So, yeah, look, that was uh, a fantastic day uh, for a number of reasons. The World Cup in India was in '97. Um, and I got dropped going into that World Cup um, and didn't play many games throughout that World Cup. Um, and I'd played for Australia, I think, three years before that, not missed the game and um, performed really well. But as as you do in cricket, sometimes you have a bit of a form slump and that pretty much happened to me leading into India. And then I got dropped um, and carried the drinks most of that World Cup. So coming over to England four months later, I had a, a real uh, desire to get that position back of opening and get, getting back into the team. So after the World Cup in India where we were successful, um, I really knuckled down when I got back and did a lot of work in prep um, for that tour. And throughout that um, Ashes tour, I worked my way back into the team. I started at uh, five and then I went to three. And then the game before Lords, I got back to opening uh, score. I think I got fifty or sixty, and then we went out to Lords on the last game and got a hundred. So for me personally, it was um, really satisfying <laughs> to get your spot back, um, to get the opportunity to open the batting at Lords, um, and then to get a hundred. Um, it was a really good day and a reminder that hard work sometimes pays off and. Uh, adversity sometimes gives you a little spur that um, you don't like to to make sure you you perform how you need to when you're playing international level and um, yeah it was an awesome day we won the series I think five nil uh, we had a fantastic night out uh, then we got on a plane and went to Ireland and we were billeted <laughs> and then I went out to in to play Ireland in the first game after getting hundred and there was a lot of hoo-ha, you know, I did a lot of press and media and then I went over to Ireland and got a duck. So I always say one day Donald Br- um, Donald Don Bradman, next day Donald Duck. So I often roll that story out to the girls when they've had a hundred and don't do too well the next day. Well, that's the highs and lows of cricket, isn't it? Uh, and on your Ashes, Ashes um, uh, performances, uh, I'll have to mention as an Englishman here, 2005 when England won the Ashes. That was a funny tour. I suppose we were getting, I retired on that tour. So it was my last tour and we had Belinda Clark also retired. So I think in that area we were really successful, but in 2005 we are probably coming to the end and we had a lot of players around the same age. Um and I remember the first, we only played two test matches in the first test match down in Brighton at Hove. Um, we had England on the ropes. Um, we needed one more wicket, I think, to win that test match. And um, Holly Colvin at the time, who was a 16-year-old, um, was batting with Aaron Brindle. Um, and we couldn't get them out and we 
missed out on winning that test match and then we went down to Worcester um, and we just had a terrible first innings and it was really hard. I think we were all out for maybe 149, something like that. Um, and I've learned in test matches, <laughs> if you don't get many in your first innings, uh, you're in strife and you really got to work hard to stay in the test and to draw it or to not lose it. And unfortunately for us, England, we're too good. Catherine Brunt, I think, maybe got a fifer in the second innings. Um, and, you know, they deserve to win. They played better than us. Um, and we lost. Um, and as a result, um, England won the Ashes. And I've heard about it ever since. <laughs> ah, I bet they don't forget that one. Well, as no. you say, you retired, retired after that tour. You'd played nine test matches, 82 one-day internationals and one T20. That must have been the, the first ever Australian T20 from looking at the records. Yeah, um, it was. Yeah. Um, how how much had the women's game changed up until 2005 from when you first, as as a young girl, had, had played cricket? Well, I, well, I think um, the appearances might indicate how much it's changed. I played um, 12 years, I think. Uh, I played nine tests and what was it, 87 one day? 82 days and one day internationals, yeah. Yeah, and, and one these days uh, the players are nearly up to 150, 200. <laughs> um, so how has it changed? Um, I was thinking that at uh, that period at the, from when you first started as a young girl, the actual exposure of the game, how much it had grown up to 2005, if you can remember. Yeah, well, I know I never saw a female on TV playing cricket um, growing up. Um, I started my cricketing career playing in clots, which is like a skirt <laughs> with long socks. Um, I, I know when we would play for Australia in the, my first few years, uh, there was no media coverage. Um, it wasn't on TV. I don't think um, over my journey as a player, uh, even in the 2005 World Cup, uh, I know in Australia it was the final was on TV because um, my brothers, obviously, who have already mentioned, aren't keen on cricket. I think they went down to the pub to watch it and I got a duck. So I've, I've been reminded of that a number of times as well. So I said, well, that was nice that you even went down to watch it because you've never seen me play. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, 2005, it was on TV and then we went, um, oh, sorry, 2000, the final was on TV. Then we went 2000 and I think it was five, the next World Cup in South Africa. Uh, I think the semis and final was played on TV. And then as you go through um, and now every game, every um you know, you can watch replays. You, we've got female commentators. Um, um, you can walk down the street and people uh, know who the cricketers are. Um, I think the the big change for me in Australia was probably the WBBL. I think it's up to its ninth year next year. I think that really changed the landscape in Australia. Um, I know... Uh, half of those games in T20 cricket were broadcast and then that's when um, young boys, girls, you know, women and men were starting to watch uh, female cricket regularly for the first time um, and then you you get to the T20 Melbourne, basically a full house um, and then the launching pad from that um, has really kicked on again. So... It's had its journey. Um, I think it's been slow, but the good thing about it now is, uh, for example, I love this story. Um, uh, my assistant coach, um, Tim McDonald, uh, he's got a little eight-year-old boy um, and he doesn't, um, he watches cricket. It's not men's or women's. He loves the Scorchers um, men's and women's team and he loves obviously the England women's team um, and he doesn't 
differential the two the two genders. He just watches cricket. So uh, I think moving forward, um, young kids watching watching cricket. It's not men's or women's cricket. They they just watch cricket. They see Elise Perry. They see Heather Knight. You know, um, and then obviously Ben Stokes and all these things. That, and they're just cricketers. Uh, which is really exciting and it shows probably the journey of how far it has come um, in my uh, journey as a cricketer and as a coach. It's really nice to see that the players are getting um, the opportunity to show, you know, what they can do and how they can play. Well, thank you for that. Um, Just moving on to your, your coaching career, was it always your intention when you packed up playing to become a coach? No, not really um, at all. I think working at Cricket New South Wales, um, and I was work, I used to do the underpinning program, which um, that state's always been very strong. They've invested a lot of money in, so we had uh, like uh, under tens through to under nineteens was pretty much my scope. And then we used to play in the um, Australian Championships, and at that stage, it was fifteen, seventeens, and nineteens. Um, and because I was playing, I never generally coached the teams, um, but I put in the structures and the and the coaching staff, and um, I planned the um, sessions that they would do, and and then handed that over to the coaches and and said, look, these are the key things um, that we need to cover in uh, this winter's program. Um, these are the sessions you'll have. These are the coaches you've got. These are the facilities. Um, and then the coaches would go away and put the detail into the week-to-week sessions. Um, so I, I was always involved, but I, I didn't coach too many teams while I was playing because I was away too much. But I, I did start coaching our um, Balmain Cricket Club, um, our women's teams, and, um, so I did that and I sort of got into it that way. Um, and then I, I guess when I was finishing my career, I always had worked anyway, so it wasn't a big deal. But the New South Wales um, job was going full time. So in 2005, um, before that, we used to always have a consultant coach who'd come in and coach. Um, they'd have other jobs and they'd do, we'd train three times a week and then we'd have other tournaments and they did that for well, Cricket New South Wales was the first state in Australia to put on a full-time coach. Um, so they encouraged me to go for the position. I said, well, I haven't really coached coached. <laughs> I've done a lot of high-performance stuff, but I haven't actually had a team. So I went and I did the interview um, and I got the job. So it was really interesting. I came over to England in August and September, October, November. Uh, In October, I was coaching the New South Wales senior team, which had six Australian players. So I've gone from August playing with my mates to September, October, coaching my mates. So that was a, a really interesting transition, which I found really hard actually in my first year and a half is actually coaching my friends. Um, and I sort of went into coaching that way. So I did New South Wales for three years and then the Aussie job came up full time. Um, I got encouraged to go for that and I went for that um, and got that. But I only did that for uh, a year because it was the same thing. I was coaching my mates. There were still players in that team that I'd played with three years earlier. Um, and they were coming to the end of their careers and I thought, well, I actually don't want to end their careers um, because I'm the coach. So I decided um, that I came over to England and started coaching over here actually um, and left the Aussie job because I wanted to keep my mates over my job. I thought I can get another job, but I've got some really good mates and I don't want to jeopardise those friendships. So um, I got into it that way and it's sort of gone from there. I've done most of my coaching in England, to be totally honest. I did the academy for England Women's Academy for five years. Um, Then I went back to uh, Australia and I did uh, the Perth Scorchers and their 50 over team uh, for five years and now I'm back 
doing the England job. So yeah. So um, why why um why um England? What to uh, uh, coaching the England women's team? Uh, what uh, why what drew you to coach another nation? Is it because you've been doing the academy? You knew the players. Yeah, it was. It's an interesting run. I'd been coaching now for fifteen years, so I felt like I had really good experience. Um, I was in New South, uh, back in Perth, and I felt um, I needed another challenge. I thought um, it'd be really nice to get back into international cricket because I I did it for twelve months, but um, I was probably not ready as a coach or the experience and I found it hard obviously coaching um, my friends and uh, the England job came out and um, I had a few phone calls um, to see if I'd be interested Um, and if I was going to coach if I was totally honest international jobs Australia and England with their resources and um their professionalism in cricket um they're really good organizations to work for um and like you said I had actually coached majority of the players that were playing in the England team now from the academy so I had a really good grasp on the players that they had um I knew uh the ECB fund and um uh, look after the team in resources. So I feel like if you've got the resources and you've got the money, you can really um, move forward as a nation. Um, so the England job came up, went for it and um, got it and um, have really enjoyed the opportunity, really grateful for the opportunity and have been loving it. It's been fantastic. Coming up in next week's episode, Lisa chatted about her time leading the England team in the 2022 Ashes and the World Cup against the challenging background of a global pandemic. Lisa also reflected on the continued growth of the women's game and how she thinks it will develop in the next decade. Here's a short clip of what you have to look forward to in episode 135. For me, it was definitely obvious we had a bit of a knock-on effect from um, the Ashes, uh, where uh, people were flat, um, tired, and uh, a lot of our batters were actually not in very good nick, um, as in they hadn't got um, too many runs against Australia and spent time in, in the in the crease. So they definitely sowed some demons going into the World Cup and p- batters especially felt like they needed time in the middle um, to build that momentum, like you said, and confidence back up from having um, a Hard Ashes campaign. Thank you for listening to The Paddock and the Pavilion. You can download the show on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, SoundCloud, Stitcher and Spotify. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at The Pad and Pad. Don't forget, if you like the show, please do leave us a rating and review. Sports Social Podcast Network. Selling your car to Carvana is as easy as... As easy as pie? Sure. All you have to do is enter your license plate or VIN. As easy as a stroll in the park. Okay. Then just answer a few questions and you'll get a real offer in seconds. As easy as singing. Why not? Schedule a pickup or drop-off and Carvana will pay you that amount right on the spot. As easy as playing guitar. Actually, I find that kind of difficult. But selling your car to Carvana is as easy as... Can be. Visit Carvana.com or download the app to get an instant offer today.